In June, I commuted Alice's sentence. When I saw Alice's beautiful family greet her at the prison gates, hugging and kissing and crying and laughing, I knew I did something right. Alice is with us tonight, and she is a terrific woman. Terrific. Alice, please. Alice Johnson was serving a life sentence for drug trafficking, but she was a first-time offender, and it was a nonviolent crime. Kim Kardashian heard about her story and advocated for her release. Kardashian appeared with Alice on the Today Show and explained how it all worked. It became this mission that I just didn't want to give up. I think to some people it might seem like, okay, Kim made a phone call to the president, showed up. We had been in talks and working on this for seven months. First call you make, though, who do you call first? I called Ivanka, and we had a really great conversation about women and wanting to help each other. And I knew that she would have understood Alice. Alice Johnson just wrote a new book about her story called Afterlife, My Journey from Incarceration to Freedom. I recently spoke with Johnson about it. Alice, first of all, congratulations on your release. Has your freedom been everything you hoped it would be, and have you had difficulty readjusting? Well, my family has surrounded me so much with, uh, I've got a huge family, and they have really made my adjustment very easy. You've become a symbol for the flaws in our criminal justice system when it comes to mandatory minimums and over-sentencing. I'm, I'm, take me back to your time in prison. At night, especially when you were alone with your thoughts, would you think about your sentence and, and whether it was fair or not, about the possibility of spending the rest of your life behind bars? What were those thoughts like? Oh, wow. Well, those thoughts would plague me sometimes. I think that's one of the reasons I kept myself busy, so that I didn't just let myself drift into that dark place. I always had hope, Andrew, that one day someone would really see my case and that I would be set free because I knew myself that my case was, my sentence was horrible. It was horribly wrong. Did you feel from the moment, I mean, even in, in court, that the sentence was far too long or that the judge's hands were tied in terms of what sentencing he could uh, afford you? I felt that the sentence was, I had no idea. When I was first sentenced, Andrew, I didn't know anything about mandatory minimum sentencing. In fact, I didn't even find out that a life sentence was even on the table until a week before my sentencing. And that's when I found out that I was facing a life sentence. And I was horrified. It took a while for me to just wrap my head around, not a outdate, not a number, but alphabet, L-I-F-E. That just floored me. And your attorneys never prepared you for that possibility of, of your sentence? I mean, you found out only a week, you said, before sentencing. That seems awfully late in the process. No, my attorney, uh, you see, I was originally offered a much lower sentence if I would plead guilty. And I was offered three to five years. So I never even thought that a three to five year offer could escalate into life. My attorney never told me that if you go to trial and you lose, that you will be facing a life sentence. And in retrospect, I wonder if he even knew it. Is that why you didn't take the deal, that you didn't take the possible three to five? Yes, my attorney told me that we had a very good case and that, and just the fact that I had received a bail when the ones who testified against me, none of those 10 people even got a bond. So I did get a, a bond that was relatively low. And he said that was a good indication that they knew that I didn't really play that big of a role in the whole conspiracy. So going through the process, I was never told that you're facing this much time. And at sentencing, the only reason I wasn't sentenced earlier in February with two other co-defendants was because they forgot to let me look at the paperwork, the PSR that had the suggested sentence for me. And when I saw the paperwork, that's when I found out that they were recommending life. You said you were hoping when you were behind bars that somebody of note would come to your aid and, and take your case. As it turns out, that was Kim Kardashian, one of the most famous women in the world. How, do you have any idea how that happened? And, and what was your reaction when you all of a sudden realized one of the most famous women in the world was in your corner? Well, first, Andrew, I didn't even know who Kim Kardashian West was. I didn't know who she was. 
um, I did a video op-ed from prison, and it went viral. Someone who Kim follows tweeted it out to her, and when she saw it, she said, she tweeted out, this is so unfair when she heard my story. She contacted her attorney, Sean Holly. They put together an incredible team that we dubbed Team Alice, and um, the ball just took off. It just took off from that point. At that point, when I realized that uh, who Kim Kardashian was, I had to get the other women in prison with me to give me pictures. I was tearing pictures out of magazines. I was getting as much information on her. And during the course of all of that, we developed a very strong friendship. And I'm going to say a family. We now consider each other family. I love Kim. You know, there's a lot of focus on criminal uh, records and, and sentencing, especially related to drugs. States are considering positions on marijuana and marijuana convictions. Your case was different, and this is a, a serious question. It was cocaine, not marijuana. It wasn't just possession or sale. You were aiding a trafficking ring. Uh, so your actions could have conceivably led to people's deaths. Some people might wonder if you were maybe the wrong person to be this example when it comes uh, up with drug sentencing. How would you respond? I would say that look at really what my role was. And also, I was a first-time nonviolent offender. I lived a life uh, as a, I'm going to say, as a very model citizen. I'd worked all of my life. And really, I, I committed my crime in getting involved in any type of a conspiracy without really knowing what I was getting into my own self. And I greatly regret any role that I played whether it was using my telephone or anything else. I never sold, nor did I use drugs. But I regret that, Andrew. If I could go back in time and change those horrible decisions, I would. But I think giving me a life sentence as a telephone mule was overcriminalization for the crime that I committed. And I tried to make amends for the things that I had did wrong by being a light in a dark place where I was. I think that what I did for other women who were being released back into society changed their communities. Finally, Alice, I, I don't know about your feelings for President Trump beyond his involvement in your case. Your story has certainly become a selling point for this president. He brought you to and mentioned you by name at the State of the Union. We're in obviously very partisan time. Some people suggesting that your case is being used by the president as something of a, of a prop or a selling point. How would you respond to people who say that? I would say we need to get away from this whole thing about politics. We're talking about people, Andrew. We're talking about not only my life, but the other lives who are sweltering and suffering in prisons right now. They don't care about the politics. They don't care who's in power. I know I don't. I know I didn't. I wanted to come home to my family. And that's what the people who I left behind, that's what they desire, is a second chance, just like I received because I am not unique. And I've been using my voice, my platform, to bring to light those people who don't have a voice. Well, I, I hope you continue to uh, advocate on this behalf and certainly a very important issue. Alice Johnson is the author of Afterlife, My Journey from Incarceration to Freedom. Alice, thank you so much for a few minutes. And again, congratulations. Thank you so much, Andrew. Up next on RFL, we shift gears to sports. Our Justin Walters is at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn for tonight's NBA draft. He's got a preview plus an update on all the last-minute activity.